in general. Meaning of eligibility, eligible, ineligibility, ineligible. One, eligibility is the state or quality of being legally fitted or qualified to be chosen. Eligibility to a public office is of a continuing nature and must exist both at the commencement and during the occupancy of an office. 2. Eligible means legally fitted or qualified to hold an office. For example, having all the qualifications and none of the ineligibilities to occupy the office. Under the Administrative Code of 1987, it is used to refer to a person who obtains a passing grade in a civil service examination or is granted a civil service eligibility and whose name is entered in the register of eligibles. Number three, ineligibility. On the other hand, refers to the lack of the qualifications prescribed by the constitution or applicable law for holding public office. Number four, the word ineligible has been defined as follows. A. Legally or otherwise disqualified to hold an office. B. Disqualified to be elected to an office. And C. Disqualified to hold an office if elected or appointed to it. The word may also refer to the person who is disqualified to hold an office. Note. The mere certification of a person by the Civil Service Commission as a civil service eligible does not amount to an appointment to any position, nor does it ensure appointment, as the appointing power has the right of choice to be freely exercised according to his judgment as to who is best qualified among those eligible. Meaning of qualification. The term qualification may be used in one of two senses. One, it may refer to the endowment or accomplishment that fits one for office. Or two, it may refer to the act which a person, before entering upon the performance of his duties, is by law required to do, such as the taking and often of subscribing and filing an official oath, and in some cases, the giving of an official bond. Subject to constitutional limitations, Congress may determine the eligibility and qualifications of officers and provide for the methods of filling offices. Nature of right to hold public office. 1. Not a natural right. Under our political system, the right to hold a public office is not a natural right. While many rights are consecrated as universal and inviolable, the right of eligibility to offices is not so secured. It exists where it exists at all. Only because and by virtue of some law expressly or impliedly creating and conferring it. The qualifications which relate to an office must be complied with by persons seeking that office. 
To hold a public office, one must be eligible and possess the qualifications prescribed by the Constitution and by law. An election or appointment to office of a person who is ineligible or unqualified gives him no right to hold the office. 2. Not a constitutional right. There is no constitutional right to run for office or hold elected office. Rather, it is a political privilege which depends upon the favor of the people, which favor may be coupled with reasonable conditions for the public good. With regard to public employment, the state that a person does not have a constitutional right to government employment is only to say that he must comply with the reasonable, lawful, and non-discriminatory terms laid down by law. Power of Congress to Prescribe Qualifications In general, Congress is generally empowered to prescribe the qualifications for holding public office, provided it does not exceed thereby its, con its constitutional powers or impose conditions of eligibility inconsistent with constitutional provisions. Qualifications for office must have a rational basis. There must be a rational nexus between any requirements and duties of the position in question. The qualifications prescribed must not be too detailed as to practically amount to making an appointment which is an executive function and not legislative. Number two, where office created by Congress. Where an office is the creature of Congress, that body can deal with the subject of qualification and disqualification, provided that in so doing it does not impinge upon any express provision of the Constitution. For example, where an office is created by a legislative enactment, Congress has the power to specify that certain classes of individuals are disqualified from holding the office. Number three, where office created by the Constitution. The general rule is that where the Constitution establishes specific eligibility requirements for a particular constitutional office, the constitutional criteria are exclusive. Thus, Congress may have no power to require different qualifications for constitutional offices other than those qualifications specifically set out in the Constitution. This is specifically true in regard to offices created by the Constitution itself. Unless the Constitution expressly or impliedly gives the power to set qualifications. Number four, where qualifications prescribed by the Constitution. Many mandatory constitutional provisions as to qualifications for office are not self-executing, as for example, the requirement that the fitness of persons to be appointed to public office shall be ascertained as far as practicable by competitive civil service examinations. Such provisions are merely announcements of a general principle clearly requiring uh, legislation for their enforcement. The right of Congress to prescribe qualifications is not inconsistent with the executive power of appointment to office. Where the Constitution has prescribed certain qualifications, Congress may prescribe additional qualifications unless it appears that this action is prohibited. Illustrative case. An unqualified person was appointed in an acting capacity. Facts. 
B was designated as member of the Sangguniang Panlungsod of Rojas City to replace I, who contends that B is not qualified to be a member of the Sangguniang Panlungsod and to replace him as the representative of the Katipuna ng mga barangay of Rojas City. Because his membership in the city barangay as Katipunan president is governed by the local government code, um, BP bilang 337, particularly, particularly section 173 which provides that the da sangguniang palunsod as the legislative body of the city shall be imposed of the vice mayor as presiding officer, the elected Sangguniang Panlongsod members and the members who may be appointed by the President of the Philippines consisting of the presidents of the Katipunan Panlongsod ng mga barangay and the Kabataang Barangay City Federation. According to I, his appointment as member of the Sangguniang Panglunsod was by virtue of his having been elected by the Katipunang Panglunsod ng mga barangay of said city as president. Thereof, in accordance with BP bilang 337, while B is not an officer, much less president of the Katipunan and has not been duly elected for any of said positions. Issue. Is the appointment of B valid? Held. Number one, an unqualified person cannot be appointed. The appointee to a sangguniang panglunsod who sits there as representative of the barangays must meet the qualifications required by law for the position. An unqualified person cannot be appointed as member even in an acting capacity. Number three, eligibility and qualifications. Letter A in general. B, not being a barangay captain and never having been elected president of the Association of Barangay Councils, cannot be appointed as member of the Sangguniang Panglunsod. He lacks the eligibility and qualifications required by law subject to constitutional restrictions. The Congress or the Legislative Authority may determine the eligibility and qualifications of officers and provide the method for filling them. The lawmaker's mandate has not been complied with. Number two. Number two, incumbent continues in office in holdover capacity I, as one who was appointed under the 1973 constitution, continues in office until the appointment and qualification of his successor. See Provisional Constitution Article 3, Section 2. Since the appointment of his successor is not valid, the tenure of I could not be determined. Um, could not be terminated on that basis alone. Ignacio versus Banate Jr. Power of Congress to prescribe disqualifications. In the absence of constitutional inhibition, Congress has the same right to provide disqualifications that it has to provide qualifications for office. However, Congress may not add disqualifications where the Constitution has provided them in such a way as to indicate an intention that the disqualifications provided shall embrace all that are to be permitted. Moreover, when the Constitution has attached a disqualification to the holding of any office, Congress cannot remove it under the power to prescribe qualifications as to such offices as it may create. Illustrative case. Act adds grounds of disqualification of a Supreme Court justice. Facts. V assails the constitutionality of Section 14 of the People's Court Act, which disqualified the justices of the Supreme Court who held office under the Philippine Executive Commission of the Philippine Republic under the Japanese from seating and voting in cases where the accused also held office under the two. The Act also provides that if the number of justices left does not constitute a quorum, 
the president may designate such number of judges of the court of first instance judges at large or cadastral judges having no such disqualifications to serve to serve temporarily as supreme court justices until judgment is said case is reached issue is section 14 of the people's court act unconstitutional held yes no act of the legislature repugnant to constitution can become a law the constitution provides how a court will be composed and how it may seat in judgment it ordains the supreme court justices shall hold only during good behavior until they reach 70 years or become incapacitated to discharge the duties thus all members of the supreme court have the power and duty to sit in the judgment in all treason cases duly brought or appealed to the court one the subject act added crowns of disqualifications of a supreme court justice such that it prohibits certain justices from fulfilling the power and duty given by the constitution although disqualified judges were not removed from office they were hampered in exercising all the powers and all the disabilities of said office in all cases properly coming before the court hence subject act cannot become law since it is repugnant to the constitution number two the act disqualified a majority of the constitutional component members of the supreme court thus it deprives it of its jurisdiction established by the constitution it deprives the supreme court of its judicial power it violates the separation of powers the designees would not have been consented to by the commission on appointments thus the appointment would not comply with the constitution since the qualifications of the inferior judges are different from a justice of the supreme court it is possible that the substitute who would act as a regular justice will not have the qualifications required by the constitution since a majority will be disqualified a majority of the supreme court shall not be so appointed and confirmed pursuant to the constitution number four more so the temporary composition of the supreme court is not authorized by the constitution since the supreme court is one of the permanent institutions of the government although the provision on the number of Supreme Court justices and the manner of their seating has a clause, unless otherwise provided by law. There is no such clause in the provision for qualifications and mode of appointment of such. Number five, even if the substitute justice would be temporary, he would be participating in the deliberations and acts of the Supreme Court. His vote will be counted as any regular justice. The method of appointment of a Supreme Court justice provided by the Constitution. Number two, eligibility and qualifications. A. In general is mandatory and binding upon all departments of government hence those not falling under the definition and those not duly appointed may not act as a as a supreme court justice even if only temporary vargas versus relio raza construction of restrictions on eligibility number one presumption in favor of eligibility there is a presumption in favor of the eligibility of one who has been elected or appointed to public office unless excluded therefrom by some legal disqualifications all persons are normally and equally eligible to 
public office. Number two, basis of presumption. A strong public policy exists in favor of eligibility to public office. A constitutional provision where the language and context allow should be construed so as to preserve this eligibility as ambiguities are to be resolved in favor of eligibility to office. In what has been described as the basic and universally accepted rule, constitutional and statutory provisions, which tend to limit the candidacy of any person for public office, must be construed in favor of the right of voters to exercise their choice and should be construed strictly and not extended to cases not clearly covered thereby. It is the same with respect to the right to aspire and to hold public office. Number three, rule of liberal construction. In other words, the right to public office should be strictly construed against ineligibility. The right of a citizen to hold office is the general rule. In eligibility, the exemption, and therefore a citizen may not be deprived of this right without proof of some disqualification specifically declared by law. However, while statutes declaring qualifications are to receive liberal construction, it does not mean that courts should give an unreasonable construction in order to uphold the right of one to hold office. Time of possession of qualification. When must the qualifications to a public office exist? At the time of election or appointment, at the commencement of the term, or at the time of assuming office, in ascertaining this matter, the language used in the constitutional or statutory provisions declaring qualifications is to be considered. Number one, where time is specified by constitution or law. The constitution or law may expressly or by necessary implication specify the time when the required eligibility must exist. Where such is the case, there can be no question but that the candidate must possess the necessary qualifications at that time. If it is specified that they must exist at the time of the election, a candidate who does not possess them at the time is not eligible although the, this, although the disqualifications cease to exist before the beginning of the term. Number two, where constitution or law is silent. If the constitution or law does not specify the time when the conditions of eligibility must exist, it is necessary for the courts to have recourse to some other means of determining the matter. The terms employed in declaring the qualifications are to be taken into consideration. A. Some courts have taken the view that the word eligible, as used in constitutions and statutes, has reference to the capacity not of being elected or appointed to office, but of holding office and that, therefore, if qualified at the time of commencement of the term or induction into office, disqualification of the candidate or appointee at the time of election or appointment is immaterial. B. Other courts take the position that the conditions of eligibility must exist at the time of the election or appointment and that their existence only at the time of the commencement of the term of office or induction of the candidate or appointee into office and assumption by him of his of his duties is not sufficient to qualify him for the office 
not letter C, where the provision refers to holding of office rather than to eligibility to office. In defining the qualifications, the courts are inclined to hold that the qualifications are to be determined at the time of the commencement of the term or the induction into office rather than at the time of the election or appointment. Number three, when qualifications must always exist, in any case, the fact that the candidate or appointee may have been qualified at the time of his election or appointment is not sufficient to entitle him to hold the office if at the time of the commencement of the term or tenure or during the continuance of the incumbency, he ceases to be qualified. Letter A, eligibility to public office is of a continuing nature and must exist at the commencement of the term and during the occupancy of the office. Letter B, the qualifications prescribed for elective office cannot be erased by the electorate alone, the will of the public as expressed. Number two, eligibility and qualifications. A, in general, through the ballot cannot cure the vice of in ineligibility, especially if they mistakenly believe that the candidate was qualified. This rule requires strictly application when the deficiency is lack of citizenship, notwithstanding evidence of the candidate's naturalization after his proclamation. Letter C, it has been held, however, that Section 39 of the Local Government Code, which speaks of qualifications of elective officials, not of candidates, does not specify any particular date or time when the candidate must possess citizenship, unlike that for residents, which must consist of at least one year's residence immediately preceding the day of election and age, at least 23 years of age on election day if the purpose of citizenship requirement is to ensure that our people and country do not end up being governed by aliens for example persons owing alliance to another nation that aim or purpose would not be thwarted but instead achieved by construing the citizenship qualification as applying to the time of proclamation of the elected official and at the start of his term. Removal of disqualifications during term. The courts have not agreed as to the effect of removal removal by an office holder of his disqualifications after the commencement of the term of office and during this continuance. Some courts hold that such removal validates the title of the incumbent, while others take the contrary view. Depending on the nature of the disqualification, the mode of removing it, the time at which it is removed, and the like. Illustrative case, elected mayor was less than the minimum age requirement of 23 when proclaimed elected. Facts, this is an appeal from the decision of the court of first instance declaring that respondent Y was ineligible to be voted as municipal mayor in enjo and enjoining him from assuming office. The court found that Y was less than 23 years of age when proclaimed elected um, article 2174 um, claimed that C was stopped from questioning the eligibility of Y issue whether or not C is stopped from questioning the eligibility of the respondent notwithstanding knowledge of such alleged in eligibility and failure to question the eligibility of why before or during the election held no candidates in eligibility always subject to question where it is necessary especially to plead is the bell if facts constituting an estapel are not pleaded, a finding that 
an estapel exists is unauthorized. The right to an elective municipal office can be contested under existing legislation only after proclamation. There is no 